The connection between gravity and electricity can be traced back to Faraday. He attempted to link these two together and stated, the long and constant persuasion that all the forces of nature are mutually dependent, having one common origin, or rather being different manifestations of one fundamental power, has often made me think on the possibility of establishing by experiment a connection between gravity and electricity. No terms could exaggerate the value of the relation they would establish. So let's explore Wall's concept for an electric dipole gravity. Electricity and gravity share some fundamental characteristics. They are both proportional to the amount of product interacting. In the case of electricity, this is the amount of charge, and in the case of gravity, this is their mass. They also both fall off with a square of distance. Ralph Sansbury's took the first step towards defining an alternative electromagnetic gravity. He stated that all subatomic particles, including the electron, are resonant systems of orbiting smaller electrical charges of opposite polarity that sum to the charge of that particle. He called these particles subtrons. The transfer of energy between the subtron in their orbit within the classical electron radius must be almost instantaneous if it is to be a stable particle. Same principle can be applied to other particles like protons and neutrons. An interesting point that Wall makes is that scientists assume that as an object accelerates at relativistic speeds they will become more massive, they increase in mass. And this is because when we accelerate protons and electrons in our massive colliders we use electric fields to accelerate them. And as we increase the energy of those fields to make them go faster and faster, they become less responsive to the field. And this is interpreted as an increase in mass, which makes it harder and harder to accelerate it. If we consider the subtron, then we will see that the electric field will squash the subtron orbits within an electron or a proton. And this will change the orbit from a circular one to an elliptical one, flattening in the direction of the applied force. As more force is applied, this is used in the distortion of the orbit rather than the acceleration of the particle. This means that the charge separation in a proton is greater than in an electron, allowing a greater distortion in a proton than in an electron. Wall's concept was that gravity is due to the radially orientated electrostatic dipoles inside Earth's protons, neutrons and electrons. Once you take into consideration that these bodies are made up of many, many, many elements, it can be seen that the force due to the dipoles will vary with the inverse square of distance, just like gravity. The 2000 fold difference in the mass of a proton or a neutron in the nucleus versus an electron means that gravity will maintain charge polarization by offsetting the nucleus within each atom. Now this all sounds great. The problem is that there is so little information on this model that it leaves me asking many questions about how this model would behave outside of a small collection of particles. So let's run through some of my main concerns and questions for this model. Now, the first problem, which I'm kind of going to split into a number of different parts, is what causes the dipole separation in the first place. If you read carefully in terms of what Wall has written in, well, I'd like to say paper, but it's not a paper, it's on, on the website, but also what he discusses in some of his lectures on the Thunderbolts, there is one grave concern before we get into the other bits. And that is the last statement that I just covered, which was that the 200 fold difference in the mass of the proton and the neutron in the nucleus versus the electron means that gravity will maintain charge polarization by offsetting the nucleus within each atom. Equally, in one of his lectures, he refers to the fact that gravity induces the distortion creating the dipole. 
This is a paradox as you cannot invoke gravity to create the dipole which then creates gravity itself. That doesn't work. Something has to initiate that dipole. You can't use gravity to say gravity creates it because that excludes the fact that gravity is being created by the dipole. The dipole cannot create itself. End of story. So if we move on from that and assume that that's just an error, then I see that there are two different ways that the dipole could be created in the first place. The first one is, let's take the example of the Earth to start off with. So the first one would be the Earth has its own intrinsic charge. So at the core of the Earth, we end up with a net, and it doesn't really matter what we call it, let's just say it's a positive charge, and then that would mean that if you start with a positive charge in the inside, that would start to create your dipoles because you would end up with charge distortion due to that uh, positive charge at the center, assuming that nothing can move towards that charge. This means that the dipoles are set up, meaning the surface takes on the same charge as the inside. We are therefore held on the Earth due to the induced dipoles in our bodies, atoms. So our bodies would take on, would become like dipoles, so therefore our feet become negative and stick to the positive ground. So the question is, does this mean that all planets have their own charge like Earth in this model? The question then also becomes, well, what about the Moon? So in order for it to orbit around the Earth, it has to be attracted towards us. And this means that it cannot have the same inner charge as the Earth. So if the Earth was positive, then it needs to have the opposite charge in order for it to be attracted towards the Earth. Now we could assume that its charge is neutral, so it has no necessarily net charge, and therefore you would end up with an induced charge, just like our bodies become induced when we stand on the surface of the Earth, and that would therefore mean that the side facing the Earth would end up with an induced charge, meaning it becomes attracted. But it equally means that the opposite side, the far side of the Moon, would end up with the opposite charge of the front facing. So you would end up with two different charge zones, induced charge zones, on the surface of the Moon. This presents a huge problem for any craft that would orbit the Moon, as its surface of this spacecraft would have induced dipoles from the surface of the Moon and from the Earth itself. So when the craft approaches the flip point, that point between on the surface of the, the Moon where it goes from one charge to the other, then the sum of the forces on it would no longer point towards the Moon. And in order to get circular motion, the net force has to point towards the center of the Moon. And this would mean that it would experience a very anomalous acceleration and would not be able to maintain a stable orbit. And we know that this is not the case. Now the second possibility is that all planets end up with an induced dipole from the Sun. Assuming the Sun is a positive charge, this would give the surface an equal positive charge. This means that each planet would have a Sun-facing charge and an opposite one on the night side. Assuming your dipoles can rearrange quickly, this would not cause too many problems for you standing on the surface. The question now becomes, how does the Moon orbit the Earth? Again, the problem here is in the fact that both bodies now have induced dipoles from the Sun, the Moon would also have an additional induced dipole from the Earth. And in this very complex scenario, there would clearly be zones of positive, negative and virtually neutral areas. And this would mean that the Moon would again not follow a circular orbit and would have anomalous accelerations. None of these scenarios are really simple. They create vast amounts of complexity, which as Wall often points out, that the simplest solution should be preferable. I find it deeply frustrating at the lack of material that Wall has produced to back up his idea. Nowhere does he go beyond the simple atoms to explain how this might work, and there are no calculations or equations. 
Now I've managed to find an alternative concept of dipole gravity by Frederick Nigard, who uses the same concept of induced dipoles to explain gravity. But his don't come from the subtrons, he's come from a slightly different concept. But the effect is still the same. He goes into a lot more detail and he describes how the induced dipoles on the surface and the inner surface would be different from both the front facing and the far facing side of these objects. But again, you end up with this very complex scenario. The same problems persist as soon as you introduce a third body. Now I will link his page down below if you're interested in reading his concept because it is quite an interesting read. There are some very simple concepts that any model must be able to explain. When we calculate the force of gravity in any system that has more than two bodies, there is a very neat little trick that can be performed. If we take an example of three bodies, A, B and C, in order to calculate we are interested in working out what the net force of gravity on A is due to B and C. We can employ a very simple trick and that is that we can ignore one of the forces and calculate each one separately. So, firstly we would calculate the force of object A by B but ignore C. We then calculate the force between A and C but ignore B. We sum the forces together and this is the net force on A. This is a very simple trick that simply works. The fact that we can do this tells us something fundamental about the force of gravity. If we look at the dipole gravity model, I cannot see how you would ever be able to calculate this for any system of three or more bodies as the surface charge is not uniform and it is changing depending on which body is closer as it induces changes in the surface. Yet we can do this and we do this when we send spacecraft out to visit other planets. Precise calculations using simple principles can slingshot a spacecraft and land it into an exact orbit using only the simple equations of gravity. For me, if this theory is to be taken seriously, then it needs more detail put into it. Without the depth that others I have covered in this series have gone to, it is very difficult to take this concept seriously. So Wall, if by some small miracle you are watching this, then know that I would be happy to create a more in-depth video if only you could help me to understand the finer points of this model and how it fits together with the observations that we already have. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.